Thank you guys all for coming out. Uh, I'm Dup Crossan. I'm the coordinator organizer here and the sole staff member. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much. Uh, I'm going to be introducing Bruce Bork here. Um, he is the uh, chief archaeologist at the Maine State uh, Museum and al also the curator of the ethnography department there. And he is here to uh, talk about his new book, The Swordfish Hunters, which uh, he's going to get into detail of, uh, but outlines an ancient people here in Maine uh, that lived on the coast. Uh, they were an ancient hunter-gatherer society that did some pretty amazing things with the primitive technology they had back then. And uh, it's definitely relevant to us coastal types here and uh, super, super interesting if you haven't heard anything. I actually just heard of them uh, a few weeks ago looking into this. So I uh, hope you enjoy it. And uh, I'm sure you'll be um, looking, uh, looking and then uh, seeing a little more of me uh, in, the next, in the next few months too. Um, I'm actually living in Brunswick now and took this job four months ago. So if you guys do have any questions or concerns along the way, I am your new contact person. So thank you guys so much. And uh, here's Bruce Bork. Thank you. So the culture I'm going to talk to you about tonight is a prehistoric culture, which only means that, that they didn't have writing. So they could not write a history of themselves. Um, so the, they're prehistoric. And so in Maine, the prehistoric period began around 12,000 years ago with a group we call the Paleo-Indians. They're the first culture in North America. And then, uh, you know, the culture changed over time and our, we study those changes. We've divide, divided the prehistoric period into three sub-periods, the Paleo-Indian period, which is a pretty brief period, then the Archaic period, which is a long period. And all it means is uh, basically in a local context, it means people who were hunter-gatherers, didn't grow crops, um, and didn't make pottery. And then beginning around 3,000 years ago, people began to make pottery, so we call those later people the ceramic period people. And the, the period we're most interested in tonight is late archaic. That's why that's underscored. Um, the Paleo-Indians lived a highly mobile lifestyle, probably mostly by hunting caribou. So this is an artist's conception of a Paleo-Indian camp scene. So you can see the caribou that are being processed. That's, that stuff hanging up there on sticks is, is jerky. That's how you would preserve caribou meat. And again, it's just an artist's conception based on you know, the, the, the archaeological evidence we have, which is not terribly informative. We basically just have stone tools. Um, there were strange animals living in North America at the time, although we think most of them had gone extinct by the time Paleo-Indians came all the way across the continent from the west into the northeast. We think caribou was the most likely, but they could possibly have been hunting all mammoths, mastodons, giant bison, big animal called a moose elk, uh, ground sloths, but the Maine has terrible fossil preservation. So we really don't know. We have one woolly mammoth from Maine in terms of large animals, that's it. And it's older than the Paleo-Indians by a thousand years or so, so it probably we suspect mammoths had become extinct by the time Paleo-Indians got here. Well, that's out of focus badly. Um, that is meant to depict an, an archaic period camp. Life is a little more settled, houses are a little more substantial, people aren't moving around so much. Um, there are more people by far. And so again, just an artist's conception, and that slide has deteriorated amazingly since the last time I used it. Um, during the archaic period, there were several cultures, and they all kind of interestingly are typified by their own style of spear point. So, you know, from left to right, that's about 8,000, 7,000, 5,000, 4,000, and so forth, up to around 3,500. And it's just kind of interesting that in eastern North America, these projector point styles do mark specific time periods pretty, pretty accurately. The next from the right is the style that was associated with the swordfish hunters, a long, narrow stemmed point. Now, the Paleo-Indians made all their tools by flaking flinty stone. The archaic people did that, but they added a new kind of tool, which was made by uh, taking a granular rock like a diabase or you know, some, some igneous or metamorphic rock with grain structure and just gently tapping it until you achieved the shape you wanted, and then you could put an edge on it by grinding. So here's a couple of adzes that came from a, a red paint cemetery. These are the red paint people um, that I recently excavated on uh, an island in the Androscoggin right nearby. And you can't really see it well in this photograph, but they're beautifully executed. They're a nice 
uh, flutes uh, running down the sides. You can see them if you look hard. So that goes way beyond the necessities of function. These would have been woodworking tools. They wanted to, they wanted to add an aesthetic f uh, finish to them. And this is probably how they were used. This is a real stone uh, adds, if they're concave at the bit, we call them gouges. And so that's a gouge on the left and an artist's uh, reconstruction of how it was probably hafted. The handle probably was a piece of a tree trunk and they, they flattened it to make a, a, a sole to go against the underside of the gouge. And then the handle was probably a branch that was attached to that part of the tree. And this just shows the kind of boats I think that they were used uh, to make. This is a fellow in the Amazon rainforest making a dugout canoe. Of course, he's using a steel axe today, but that's sort of the kind of watercraft that you can easily make with stone tools. Now, the weapon system of the era was probably not the bow and arrow. The bow and arrow seems to have arrived quite late in North America. Instead, it was the spear thrower, which is really just an extension for your arm that increases the force with which you can propel a spear, or a dart, we call it. It's a small spear with a socket in the end, and it's fletched like an arrow. And uh, it probably had a foreshaft, which allows you to take a shot. If the foreshaft hits the animal, the, the, the shaft would most likely drop back. You probably didn't kill the animal. You're going to have to track it until it bleeds out. Uh, and so you want to maybe have another shot so you have a bag of four shafts with projectile points already mounted on them. So you can just essentially reload uh, your spear quickly. The thing at the bottom is a, a weight. Some of these people put weights on their spear uh, throwers. Um, most people think it, it somehow it affects the, the distance or power with which you can throw the spear. I know it's counterintuitive. I'm not sure I believe it myself, but that's what most people think. But the point is this is our entree into the red paint people, uh, the swordfish hunters, AKA the red paint people. The earliest phases of their mortuary ceremonialism was at a site uh, up uh, just opposite Indian Island in Old Town, the Godfrey site. And from it came these these are, these are spear thrower weights. Spear throwers are also called atlatls. That's the Mexican word for them. <clears throat> and there's the a couple things about them. They're nicely finished, so they too are taken beyond. I mean, all you really do need for weight is a stone to strap to the, the, the shaft. But these are nicely polished and finished. That's one interesting thing about them. The other interesting thing is that they're all made of the same stone. The same two-tone stone. It's gray and green. And we don't know where it's from, but this tells me intuitively that there's a symbolic function here. They're not just nice to look at, but the fact that it has to be this stone means they probably attributed some spiritual slash supernatural property to this stone. And this is one of the salient characteristics of this culture. There's a lot of symbolic expression. And we see it in these red paint cemeteries. We don't see it so much in the villages. The animals that they uh, had available to them were about the same during the archaic period as we have today. You know, deer, moose, bear, marine mammals, represented here by a seal, and fish in the sea. The left is a codfish, and sturgeon and salmon, and then a mollusk on the right, a clam. And they exploited all of these. Now, when I'm talking to my archaeological colleagues, I use the term moorhead phase for this culture. It's just a way we name cultures in archaeology. And it's named after a man named Warren Moorhead, who uh, was probably the most aggressive in doing surveys, looking for sites of this culture, and in excavating them. He worked out of the RS Peabody Foundation in um, Andover, Massachusetts, on the campus of the Academy. And uh, he was a very aggressive field worker. He also had another career as an Indian agent. Here he is at Wounded Knee, where he had the misfortune of loaning his camera to a photographer to take those pictures that uh, revealed the tragedy that occurred there. And he lost his job for that. But he, re he landed on his feet as an archaeologist in Maine. The red paint people are known for their red paint graves. And this is a red paint grave I found down at uh, Atkins Bay many years ago. Uh, I was looking for the Popham colony, couldn't find that, but I walked around the corner and there was red ochre coming down the bank. So what red ochre is is a powdered uh, hematite. It's, a, it's an iron oxide and it's uh, in its lumpy form. It looks like graphite or something. It's kind of a silvery gray, very dense, very heavy. But when you pulverize it, it turns bright red. It's quite a remarkable transformation. So this was produced in large volumes to put in pits, which we're quite sure were graves, along with a lot of tools. Some of the tools are very spectacular, as we'll see in a minute. And you can see the, the tape and the knife for scale. And that's exactly how I found this. It was just these things sticking right out of the bank. It was soft sand. The bank was eroding. And I think another couple of storms, and you would have found some artifacts down on the beach. You wouldn't have seen them in situ, as we say. 
Those cemeteries are usually on prominent features. This is a, a feature that had a red paint cemetery on it. It's the Ormsby property here in town. And um, it's probably the most prominent landform that has a red paint cemetery. It's very prominent. It doesn't look like much when you approach it from the road, but when you get down at the uh, end of the marsh that's, that lies at its foot, you can see it's a very prominent landform. And this is the sort of thing that they sought out to, as, as we do too. I mean, our cemeteries are often on prominent landforms, aren't they? Okay, so I say they're most likely composed of human burials, but there's no bone in any of them except for one site. Um, uh, when you add mollusk shell to an archaeological site, it neutralizes soil acids, and that allows the bone to be preserved. And there was one cemetery that happened to have been built um, on top of or into, dug into, a uh, what we call a shell midden, a shell heap, uh, a site that has a lot of shell in it, and that neutralized the acids and the bone was preserved. So at that site, which otherwise looked like a lot of other red paint cemeteries in terms of the artifacts and the ochre, this also had human remains. So by inference, we think that all these sites uh, in, included human remains. We know that there were pits dug for other purposes as well, but uh, probably most of them were human burials from which the bone has completely vanished. There are different styles of burial. There's the standard extended, you know, the bodies placed in the grave. These are bundle burials. The, the, the death occurred somewhere else, some time in previous to the burial, the uh, bones were defleshed somehow, and cultures have many ways of doing this. Exposure to birds of prey, just plain exposure. Uh, there are, you know, but they were skeletonized, disarticulated, and wrapped into bundles. So we have three individuals represented here, three bundles. Okay, let's go through some of the artifacts that make the red paint cemetery so famous. Uh, probably the most ubiquitous are these gouges, and they come in a wide variety of sizes. And I think that probably they were used for making dugout canoes. And the small ones may have been used for making, for, for decorating those canoes. And the reason I say that is we've never found a canoe. We probably never will. But uh, they decorated other things. So I think it's highly likely that they decorated their watercraft. Not all the gouges are local. Um, the, the gouge on the left I handled back in the late 60s when I was doing my dissertation research. I thought it was an exquisite thing. And the curator, uh, Doug Byers, agreed. And he once said it's the most exquisite, uh, how did he phrase it? The epitome of polished stonework. And he's a man who knew, uh, knew archaeological collections all over the world. And so I expected I'd find more of these beautiful things, but I never did. And then um, it was stolen, along with a whole lot of other stuff from the RS Peabody Museum. A lot of that stuff was returned, but this, this piece was never returned. Someone covets this piece today, I guarantee it. So I, I, I was, remained puzzled for 30 odd years about why I couldn't find more of these until I visited a museum in Canada, uh, actually the, the, the CMC in uh, Hull, Quebec. And there I looked at a, at a sort of similar red paint site from Newfoundland, and there the gouges were, the exact same gouges. I suddenly knew that this gouge and the one on the right, it's two, two views of the same gouge. That's also from a main cemetery. They were importing these gouges from the far north. So we have ceremonial elaboration. We have connectedness to people far, far away. Those themes will keep coming up as we, as we go along here. These are some of the ones from that, that Newfoundland Cemetery. They're in the book, and if you, uh, you know, take a minute to look at them closely, you can see that they are very different from the gouges these folks made for themselves. So they're trading these heavy, clunky stone tools from far away. So that means that not, they don't, not that they couldn't make their own gouges, but these special northern gouges had a symbolic meaning to them. So Twilling Gate is the site from which those gouges came. It's the one on the far right. And the, uh, the island uh, in the river here, which has no name, so I call it No Name Island, is the site that produced uh, uh, the gouges I showed you earlier. Now here's a funny artifact. It's a humble kind of artifact. It's a tool to make a tool. They're pecking stones. They're, they're the tools that you tap against the rock to shape the gouge. And you would think, well, that's sort of an expedient tool. You pick up any rock and use it and then discard it. But this culture, I think alone in North America, maybe Dick Doyle will correct me on that, but I know of no other culture that, uh, that so treated their hammerstones that they became perfectly spherical. If you start using a hammerstone, you'll find yourself using the pointy part of the rock to tap, and eventually it'll go away because you're shattering the rock as you're shaping your tool. So if you keep using it and keep using it and keep using it, it'll turn into a sphere. And that's what these are. And there's only one culture I know of in the whole world, and that's an upper Paleolithic culture in France that made these things. So as humble an artifact as it is, 
It's a really odd one. Uh, the gouges and adzes were sharpened with a whetstone, and this is one of the early kinds of whetstones in the red paint cemeteries. Uh, it's pierced at one end, probably had a thong in there to hang it from a, I don't know, it's pretty heavy. I wouldn't want it hanging on my belt, but uh, it, it no doubt had a thong on it. And, uh, you know, it's a nice, it has a nice smooth uh, surface from being used to sharpen these tools. Plummets are really very common, not only in cemeteries, but really mainly in village sites. And they, they come in two sizes, big ones and little ones. And the little ones, a um, little hard to know exactly how they were used. I suspect they were tied to the margins of nets. So a gill net that you want to put across the river, you might tie them to the bottom so the net didn't you know, trail off in the current. The big ones are about a good size for fishing for cod, and they did catch a lot of cod. So I suspect that you know, they're both fishing implements, sinkers basically, but probably were used in two different ways. But then the functional plummets kind of grade into non-functional plummets, and they further grade into animal figurines, and it's hard to know where to draw the line, but by the time, well, let's, let's say if you're in, let's go from right to left. On the right are sort of functionally looking plummets, plummety things, and by the time you're in the middle, you can see they're beginning to assume strange shapes, right? And then by the time you get to the left, they're just outright figurines mm -hmm. of either real or I think imaginary mammals. Uh, this one is a sort of a marine mammal-y kind of thingy, but it's got horns on it, so it's not a real marine. Oh, they're various igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks. They're granular rocks. Granular rocks are softer than flinty rocks, but they're tough. If you try to, if you, flinty rocks, you can flake them in a predictable manner, but they break easily because they're brittle. It's like glass. Now, these rocks with grains in them, they're softer, but they're, they're tougher. They won't shatter so easily. So that's why they selected those kinds of rocks. And here's just some more really strange little things. So, you know, I mean, those ones on the right, they're plummets, but boy, they're darn strange plummets. Okay, another little uh, small artifact that you find in cemeteries. And by the way, the utilitarian plummets are common in villages. The figural plummets are almost always only in the cemeteries. And these crescents are also from cemeteries. Crescents and other little, and these are made from ground slate mostly. And all I can say is that the crescent form is the predominant shape, and it might be meant to invoke a swordfish tail because there's a swordfish hunters after all, but I can't prove that. Now, I mentioned that they were decorating some of their tools. This is one class of tool they decorated. They're bone daggers. They're cut from a particular moose leg bone, and then they're ground into, they have this nice dagger point and they have nice sharp edges. And I think I've never actually replicated and tried to use one for a cutting edge, but I suspect they might have been pretty darn effective. But at any rate, they're beautifully decorated, and you can't see it. The real ones are on the left, but they're, you know, they're over 4,000 years old, so the surface is eroded. But they have this amazing, fine, incised decoration. It's incredibly uh, um, small in scale and precise in its execution. So there's a drawing on the right, and you can see these blow-ups, which is what the artist had to do so that you could, he could in, enlarge the uh, image to the point where your eye, your eye could recognize it. And these are not single lines. These are often rows of perfectly parallel three lines with little tick marks per, uh, you know, uh, along the, uh, the, the linear motif. Another very unusual artifact I found both in, in burials and in villages uh, are little needles. Now, Indians generally in this part of the world wore draped clothing. They, they might have leggings and they might have sleeves, but they wore capes and loincloths and you know, things like that, and they didn't, didn't use needles. They used awls, so they'd punch a hole and then stick sinner or whatever they're using for, to, to sew it up through the hole. But these are real eyed needles. Now, prehistorically, the next nearest eyed needles I know about, might, there might be some in New York, I forget, but the, but the northern peoples the Eskimo type cultures in the far north, they wear tailored clothing, right? It's cold. So they wear anoraks and pants and all that. And so they, they use bow needles. Now does that mean these folks had tailored clothing? It might, which would be very different from um, later people in this period, in this region. These are the strangest uh, of the artifacts that come out of the red paint cemeteries in terms of being able to identify them. They're actually fire making kits. Uh, there's a bunch of ways to make fire. Most, pe most prehistoric people use wood friction, either drills or you could, you could literally just rub two sticks together. If you know what you're doing, you can get them hot enough to, to shoot a spark. But um, 
these are essentially the prehistoric equivalent of flint and steel. You know, when you strike flint against steel, it'll shoot a spark, and if the spark falls into the tinder, it'll start you a fire. Iron pyrite will do the same thing, all right? But the thing is, when you bury iron pyrite, it gets what they call pyrite disease. It, it turns into, it, it falls apart into sulfuric acid and uh, an iron oxide. And the iron oxide cements the sediment in, in which it is buried. So these are decayed lumps of a pyrite-rich rock. And those holes in the center with a little flinty stone against, the, against which the pyrites were struck. Now, this is the strange way to make fire. There's only this one slightly earlier case in Maine, the ancestors, the immediate ancestors of the red paint people. And then the next later occurrence I know of is in the Midwest 2,000 years later. So it's a very unusual way to make fire. And what's even more unusual is that we don't have good pyrite rocks in Maine. Uh, you know, if you drill into the, into the middle of a ledge, uh, there are pyrites, but by the time they get near the surface, that pyrite disease has destroyed them. So where are they getting the iron pyrites? What so happens that in northern Labrador and Quebec, there's lots of iron pyrites. So again, we're, we're sort of looking to the north as an explanation for where these things came into the state. Once in a while, we get a little organic preservation. In this case, these are the enamel caps of shark teeth. The bony part of the tooth is gone, and the sharks, of course, have cartilage and a skeleton, so they're all protein and they go very quickly. But we have these enamel caps, and these, these are found in a few red paint cemeteries. These are mako shark. We've also found gray.